Father, we are so honored and privileged this morning. Lord, that your presence has met us here. Yes, sir. Father, we completely you, honor you. We give you glory. We thank you, Lord, for this 2019. The ups and the downs, everything that comes with, Lord, you have never forsaken or left us. And we thank you for that. Father, this morning as we open your word now, Father, we ask, I ask a couple of things, Father. First and foremost, Lord, that we will set our hearts and our minds and be ready to intake your daily bread. And then, Father, I ask that we leave here transformed today, a different person, Father. We should always be growing in the knowledge of who you are. So this morning, I pray that for all who are here under the sound of my voice. And lastly, I pray, Father, that you allow me to decrease, you increase, and that I teach your word as you would have me teach nothing of myself but only of you. And I ask this in the miraculous, marvelous name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. In his name we pray. Church said? Amen. 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 You may be seated. So this morning, uh, I was told, too, where we can tighten up. If we can tighten up for any seats in between, if you can tighten up a little bit. We, we always have late comers. And we appreciate that. And then us just, if you have, let them know we have some seats all the way up front as well. So this morning, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at about six verses, uh, verses 6 through 9, actually four verses, 6 through 9. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is there's purpose in your pain. Anybody got any painful yes. things that have gone on this year? There's purpose for that pain. Many times we, we think uh, it's all because of something we've done. Many times we think it's all because, you know, life is just not fair. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? But as believers, we have to take a step back and assess, yeah, I did mess up. There are consequences sometimes for the things that I do. But a lot of times God will allow or send thorns in your life. He'll send thorns in our lives for said purposes. And we're going to jump into that and dive into this morning as we hear what the Apostle Paul is saying to the Church of Corinth. Now, let me give you a little bit of background before I get into the word. The Church of Corinth was a very interesting place. It was actually a pagan society, a pagan church. Uh, it was a lot of stuff that the, the Corinthians had to overcome, a lot of things. Paul was that special messenger sent to the Gentiles. And he was sent to establish this church. Now, he's going back to this church in a letter where he's having to prove himself. He's gone in. He's talked to them. He's given them the word. This is the second letter. They had sin in the church. He had to ask people to remove the sin from the church. There was a young man sleeping with his mother-in-law. And they just let it go on. And nobody said anything because confrontation is hard. And Paul addressed them on that. And then he comes back and says, now the young man is repentant, now let's restore him. And he goes on and he's talking uh, uh, to the church of Corinth. And they've gotten a little sideways with Paul. So Paul is now saying to them, listen, you know, I I'm coming to you as humbly as I know how. And he begins to tell them, because they got a little bit of an attitude, because Paul is a corrector. And they begin to, Paul begins to tell them, look. If you only knew my plight, if you only know where I've gone, where I've been, I've experienced a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've even been taken up to the third heavens. I don't know if it was me, if I was asleep, if it was my real body, mm -hmm. but I've seen and heard things in heaven that I can't even speak about. Mm -hmm. So he's qualifying. He's qualifying that I am an apostle as well as the other apostles. And as he goes into his qualifications, we're going to pick up here to see what Paul, where Paul is going with this as he discusses the pain and the afflictions he's dealing with within himself. So this morning, if you would read with me, and it should be up on the screen behind me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we want to look at verses 6 through 9. And the verses read, Paul says, if I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it. Because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Listen to this now. 
a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Wow. Now, now, let me address something real quick. So he says, I received such re wonderful revelations from God so to keep me from coming proud. I was given a thorn in my flesh from a messenger from Satan. Do y'all hear it? Now, I don't want y'all to miss this. This, is, this may or may not be in my message. The Lord is prompting me. I got to say this again. Just because you're going through something, you're receiving something, you got to understand. Everything that happens has to go across God's desk. If you're a child of God, he has to prove every single thing that happens to you. It has to go by him. And we as believers, we've got to learn to grow up and accept the things that God is allowing to happen in our life. There's a purpose for them. So I want you to don't miss what Paul just said. He says, the Lord sent a messenger. He say he sent Satan, a messenger by Satan. In other words, Satan has demons and he has folks working for him too. And then let's go on. Then he says, I was given this thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Verse 8, three different times. That means three different seasons during this time. It wasn't like I prayed three times in a row. Three different seasons in my life, I asked God to take it away. And I love what he says. He says, each time he said to me, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now, I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen? Amen. There's a purpose in your pain. The first point I want to lay out to you this morning God uses pain to do what? To get our attention. To get our attention. Uh, I'm going to say this. Some of y'all just hang on. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, most of us in this room know we would not be on our knees crying out to God if things always went well. Come on, let's go. You got to say, man, that's okay. I don't really need it. But the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, most of us would not be on our knees and petitioning God like we ought to if everything always went fine. That's why when I talk to believers and, and they always tell me rarely, they always say, man, life is great. It's always great. It's never, I never hear anything bad or I need prayer. I'm worried about you. Do the one thing, two, one or two things that happen. You either lie about your status. Or you may not be in right relationship with God, or you may not know him at all. Because the moment we sell out to Christ is when the real battle starts. Anybody understand what I'm talking about right now? When we really stick, put a stake in the grass and say, Lord, I'm going to follow you no matter what, that is when the enemy rears his head. See, he ain't got to rear his head when we walk alongside him and we're doing everything else he, he's doing or he wants us to do. But God wants, God uses, he wants to use his pain to get our attention. Paul had been allowed to see and to hear things so wonderful. God needed to keep him focused on his purpose. Paul's a man just like us. God knew he had seen and done so many things. You know how many churches Paul, the apostle Paul was allowed to start? His ministry was powerful. The apostle Paul was allowed to participate in miracles, to hear these wonderful things from heaven. He started church after church. He's responsible for writing two-thirds of the New Testament. Now, as wonderful as all that is, God knows each one of us, and each one of us has the propensity to become what? Proud. Prideful. Look at what I did. Oh, look at me. Look at what I've accomplished. So, the Lord sends this messenger. Sometimes it takes pain to get us to do what God wants us to do. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Many of us are confused about that. Why is God allowing this to happen to me? You got to take a step back. and Am I in his will? Am I walking as he has me or he would have me to walk? That is the question we need to ask ourselves. 
because he loves us so much. He's so concerned about our souls. He will allow us to have temporary afflictions in our lives if it's going to save our souls. So this morning, if you're going through and you're dealing with some pain and you're wondering, you ask the question, why? Ask a different question. Lord, what do I need to do to get on your train? That's the question. Lord, where am I out of kilter with you, Lord? Where is it in my life that there are pockets of hidden sin that I'm kind of sweeping under the rug I'm not willing to really deal with? Those are the questions we need to ask him. Now, y'all remember Jonah, right? Everybody remember Jonah? Right, he built the ark, remember, and had the animals come. Everybody know I'm just checking to see if y'all know the Bible. Somebody, somebody be like, yeah. No, that, that was Noah. But I'm just checking. I'm just saying who knows what. So Jonah was a such person who God had given him instructions. I want you to go to Nineveh. There is a group of people there that I'm going to destroy. But Jonah, I want you to take my word to give them an opportunity for salvation. And Jonah felt like in his own mind, they're not worthy to be saved. So Jonah goes a different direction. He gets on a ship or a boat, and he's going to Joppa. And in the midst of him going to Joppa, because Jonah belonged to God, he was God's prophet, God says, okay, Jonah, have it your way. Go ahead and get on the boat. Take your little ride, but I'm going to fix you. <laughs> I'm sending you a different kind of ride. And that ride was in the form, the Bible says, a big fish. We believe it was a well. In the, and it got so bad on the boat. The storm came. God sent the storm. And Jonah confessed. And he said, y'all going to be killing you unless you throw me off. And he was thrown off. And the moral of the story is he was swallowed up by this gigantic, ginormous fish. And it was only then when he was in the belly of the well or the belly of the fish that he turned his eyes up to heaven and said, Lord, I have been wrong. Lord, save me from myself. Now, I got a question for y'all. Some of y'all know you're on the verge of riding the belly of the fish. This morning, I'm not asking you to stand up, make a public rundown, but you, start, you need to start getting yourself right with God right now. Because you know when you're on the verge, God has told you one thing, and you're going a different direction. And it doesn't matter about your age. If you, whether you're young, we have a lot of students here. Whether you're young or whether you're more mature. We don't say old here. But whether you're more mature in Christ. Check yourself before you take a little trip with the fishes. At the bottom, listen to what Jonah said. At the bottom, Jonah said, when I had lost all hope, in other words, he thought he was dying in the fish's belly, I once again turned my thoughts who and where? To the, to the Lord. To the Lord. God uses pain, church, to get our attention. Point number two. He also uses pain, as we read, to keep us humble. The Apostle Paul said that God did not take away his pain for said purposes. This pain would help keep his ministry in order and to keep him from becoming conceited because of the surprising greatness of the revelations he had partaken in. A thorn was given to him in his flesh. Listen to what Corinthians chapter, uh, Corinthians 2, 12, 7. Suffering can certainly keep us from being conceited because it tends to keep us humble and reliant upon God. Listen to Proverbs 20, 30. It says, physical, listen to this, physical punishment cleanses away evil. Such discipline purifies the heart. Now read this one again. I love this one. Physical, because this, this is really uh, my house. We believe in spanking. I don't believe in the time out stuff. We believe in the paddle. We believe in this verse. Physical punishment cleanses away evil. Such discipline purifies the heart. My lovely children, I'm not trying to embarrass you, but that does this word. It's better to beat them because it won't kill them. In other words, sometimes a timeout is not going to work. Sometimes there needs to be some physical pain God wants to use to get your focus right, to get my focus right. Now, we got some timeout folks in the house. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going with the word. I'm, so, I'm going with the word of God. Amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. He says, I am glad not because it hurts you, but because the pain turns you to God. Don't you like that verse? 
again, 2 Corinthians 7 9. I'm going to write this one down. Paul says, I'm not glad because it hurts you. That's God. He doesn't desire to hurt you. Understand that he will use any methodology it takes to turn his children's heart back to him. I'm going to read this one again. 2 Corinthians 7 9. I'm glad not because it hurts you, but because the pain turns you to God. And I'll say it myself. Amen. Amen. Point number three. God uses pain to teach us to depend on him. Let's read verses 8 and 9 again. Let's look at these verses again. In chapter 12. God uses pain to teach us to depend on him. 8 and 9 says, Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, I love this, my grace really is sufficient. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weaknesses. So now I'm glad to boast about boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. You don't know that God is all you need until God is all you got. You don't know that God is all you need many times until God is all you have when you can't call mama. When daddy can't be found. When my best friends who I thought were my best friends can't be found. Isn't it ironic then we call upon the Lord? Guys, listen, and, and I don't typically make New Year's resolutions, but I'm going to make one here before the church. I am going to start calling upon the Lord first before I call upon anybody. Now, what do you mean, Pastor? You're a pastor. You're a preacher. You're supposed to be doing that anyway. Well, I got, I got problems, too. I have issues, too. That doesn't exempt me because I stand here. I have a tendency, I have two or three men in this church I can call any time of the night, day, and I can tell them all about it. And I know it goes no further. But here's what the Lord said to me. He said, Kim, call me first. He said, talk to me first. I, I, I'm here for you. But we have a tendency, our tendency is to reach out to those. Mom and dad and all that. Some, one day mom ain't going to be there. That is not going to be there. When we stand before Christ at the Bema seat of judgment, you are going to be standing there alone. You can't say, well, Mama said it's going to be on you. Once you make the decision to follow Jesus Christ, listen, young or mature, it is on you. You can't take anybody there with you when Jesus is judging you. Now, again, for the believer, the Bema seat in the judgment is not about heaven and hell. It's about rewards being given or taken away. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want all mine. <laughs> Whatever God has for me rewards, and listen, guys, listen, see, let's, let's, let's back it up. And some of y'all think, oh, Lord, that, you mean that Bentley I didn't get on earth, I'm going to get in heaven? No, calm down. No. The rewards are going to be levels of responsibility he's going to trust you with in heaven. Some of you may rule over 10 cities. Some of you may rule over 50, 100. Now, some of us is just going to be glad we're sweeping the gold dust up off the floor. <laughs> so it depends on what we do and how we do. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10. I like this. I had to write this down. I typed this. He said, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Sometimes you got to remind yourself, I serve a God who has actually raised the dead. Yes. My situation may appear dead, but God can raise my situation. And he did, verse 10, and he did rescue us from mortal danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. Is anybody in the need of rescue? Amen. See, he is faithful. He will rescue us, even using pain. Mm -hmm. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Some of you are, are, are dealing with some pain this morning. Listen, he's rescuing you, even in pain. If you belong to him, understand if you belong, he loves you so much, he's willing to allow you to suffer a little pain. Some of y'all say, a little pain? You don't understand. <laughs> hey, listen. Comparatively, 
And what I mean, compared to the hell burning all the rest of your eternity, this is light. Yeah. This is light. Compared to hell. <laughs> Listen to what Psalms 119.71 says. It was the best thing that could have happened to me, for it taught me to pay attention to your laws. What is the psalmist talking about? God had to bring him to his knees, had to strike him down, had to get his attention, because he wanted to go to the road. So the psalmist says, it was the best thing that could have happened to me, for it taught me to pay attention to your laws, in other words, to your word. It brought me back to where I really should have been to begin with. The truth is, sometimes pain is the only thing that gets us where we ought to be. And God knows that. Yeah. Depending on God is one of those things. Listen, the Lord doesn't want us to depend on him part time. He wants our 100% accountability and he wants us 100% depending on him and who he is. And that's where we are. And we all are different places. I talked about this last week. We all are growing at different rates. I know everybody's not at the same place maturely and spiritually. However, however, he will do whatever it takes to get his, those of us who love him, to the place we need to be. Point number four, and I'm wrapping up here. God allows pain to give us a ministry for others, or to others. Some of y'all yeah. veterans shaking your head like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no ministry had I not gone through what I've gone through. Yeah. Pain prepares you to serve. If you really love God, God always takes what seems to be the bad stuff. Y'all have heard the term beauty for ashes. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. He takes the ashes, the things that have been burned up and consumed in your life. He takes those things that you never thought you were going to get over. The things that happened to you as a little girl, a little boy, you never thought you, you'd make it through. Things that happened that shouldn't have happened in your family. You go, why did this happen? He will take those things and he will turn the, the ashes to beauty. If we just trust him, we depend on him. He, 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 well, how did he let it happen? Listen, we live in a sensitive world. Sometimes it really is not your fault. Sometimes things happen to us because it's called life. Yeah. Amen. It's because our ancestors, Adam and Eve, couldn't, couldn't keep it together, and we suffer the consequences. But here's the beautiful part. Even, with, even though we suffer, suffer the earthly consequences, we eternally have a place with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And that's good news. Mm -hmm. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 and 4. He comforts us in all our troubles. Did it say some? He said in all of our troubles. All of them. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can do what? Comfort who? Others. Mm -hmm. Let me speak to these athletes in the room real quick. Not just ECS, because I know um, we got a bunch of athletes here today from, that play basketball, some of the parents. Here at our church, we have a small church, we have a lot of athletes. We have guys go D1, D2, the football, basketball, too. We're just blessed. We have a, a ton of students. So let me, let me speak to all of our, our athletes. You have a heavy responsibility. God did not gift you the bouncer ball or the throw a football or the kick a soccer ball or hit a baseball for your own little glory. Now, mom and daddy, sometimes we mess it up, and all we can see is our own little Billy, our own little Bobby. I hope ain't no Billy and Bobby's in here. Uh, it's not personal. It's not personal. But what we need to be pointing our children towards, the students, hear me, is using your gift to bring God glory. Do you hear me today? Using the God-given gift you have because you can bounce a ball better than anybody else. You can throw a football or run whatever it is better than anyone else. He wants you to use your giftings for his glory. Now, let me tell you what else that means. That means that you also to use your status to take care of the least of those. Mm -hmm. Go to that lunchroom and find that kid. Everybody's making fun of him. May not smell good. May not have what you have. And make yourself available as a friend to that person. Befriend the least of those. You want to know what being like Christ is? Do that, student athlete. And watch God use you to maybe, to maybe even save a life. 
There's too many young people that are caught up in social media and whatnot. They, they care more about what somebody is saying them, about them on social media. By the way, who does nothing for you? They don't feed you. They don't clothe you. They don't do anything for you. We listen to that nonsense, and we allow them to shape uh, 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 to shape our, our, our a vision of ourselves or to shape our thoughts about ourselves, we got to cut it out. <laughs> and listen to what the Lord says about us and what our parents say about us. Amen. But take your talent and use it to be a blessing to somebody else. Alright? Can we do that, young folk? Yeah. Can we do that? Amen. Amen. That is using your giftedness to minister to someone else. Now, many, many of y'all too young to have really gone through anything really painful. Listen, your breakup with your first girlfriend doesn't count. Let me just help you. Uh, your boyfriend, it doesn't really count. So you haven't really gone through much, but use your giftedness to be a blessing to someone else. Now, everybody needs recovery of some type. I don't care who you are, you've been through something in your life. I don't care who you are, where you come from, we've all been through something, and we need some kind of recovery. You know, I, I, can, I just always, I'm always transparent with me and my wife for 33 years. We have gone through some things. You know, you're not married this long and not go through some stuff. So I don't stand here every week and pretend like our little life is perfect. We had it rough to begin with. Part of that was when you come together two different worlds, you bring this. You bring your thing and you bring it and we think we just make it work. No, it takes a lot of work to make it work, but it, it can bring on different issues and it can bring on different different problems and it can bring on different struggles to the point to where many people don't make it. You know, God has taught me that marriage is used for sanctification. What does that mean? What are you talking about? Marriage is used to help the one person help the other person to become more like Christ. You will never be more challenged when you get married to be forced to become like Christ or to just be a jerk in your marriage. <laughs> I'm just being, I'm being true. Somebody know what I'm talking about. But as you work through that, God begins to use that in your relationship to strengthen each other and you become, you look more like Christ. And where am I going with this? This church is started because my wife and I decided divorce would never be used. Again, we used it the first five years, probably 50 million times a year. But we decided and we stuck a stake in the ground, we're not going to let that word dictate our home and bring about fear and uneasiness and unrest we don't allow in our home. And out of that, yeah, we had some attacks to come. You know, the enemy sends that messenger, you know, we read about earlier. But we stood together. And as a result, we got help. And now we're helping. You see, out of our pain was born actually this church. We just began to minister people in our living room. And before we knew it, it was like 30 people that I didn't know. We're ministering to. You know, today, God wants to use whatever you've been through to minister to someone else. Now I'm talking to the big folk who've been yep, through some yep. stuff. Yep, I'm yep. talking to the more mature people who've really gone through some things. Yep. He wants to use what you've gone through now that you take it. See, now, now you may need some help right now. You may need to go through some healing some unresolved issues and pain that you do deal with and you have. So you may need to go through that and get through that. But when you do, it's not to sit on it and come to give a praise report and a, and, a, and a shout hallelujah and then you sit down. No, it's time now for you to go to work. In your relationship, there are other couples that you can touch. Now it's going to mean being a little bit transparent, putting yourself out there. Yeah. See, somebody needs to know that you just don't drink, wake up looking like this. You just don't wake up looking like you stepped out of whatever magazine it is. It took some work. It took some hard labor to get to the point to where my wife and I can stand together and really help people. But it also means that we have to let the shade down and let people really see what was going on. Sometimes that's just very difficult. But if it's for the sake of saving another couple, if it's for the sake of saving another family so I don't have to get a phone call about my, that there's a divorce coming, if it's for the sake of really preserving and reserving life within a family, I will tell it all. We will tell it all if it means we got to really help somebody in that regard. Can you imagine the army of ministries that go out of this little small church if we all took that to heart? 
We all have something to offer. See, many of you sitting there thinking, well, I'm just going through. I don't have much to offer. I'm struggling. Yes, you do. The struggle and pain is going to lead to your ministry. Yeah. That's why we don't put a bunch of dockets on the board. Hey, we need people to sign up for this ministry. No, ministries are going to be born organically in this church. I'm not fooling with that anymore. I've learned the hard way. Don't start a ministry until somebody has been burdened enough and through enough pain to say, I'm in, Pastor, and this is what God's called me to do. That's the only time ministry is truly work in churches. If I got a call and a bed and plead, man, that's not ministry. Mm -hmm. That's just trying to fulfill stuff God probably had not called most churches to do. But if we take it personal upon ourselves and say, Lord, what I've been through, Lord, I'm willing to step out on the lead and help somebody. Oh, God, guys, look, we could have to have five, six services in this place if we just did that. Hmm. If, we don't, if we just just did that. God uses your pain, truly, to help other people. I want to end with this. He wants to use whatever hurts, whatever issues, whatever problems you've gone through. He never wastes any or any pain. He yeah. never wastes, wastes yeah. it. He yeah. never does. He wants to use it for his glory and for our good. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Would you stand on your feet? Let's, let's pray. Father, I'm just looking out this morning. The Lord, yeah, the house is packed and we, we got some wonderful guests here. Mm -hmm. Lord, you, you're doing business with some of us this morning. With most of us, you're doing business with us, Lord. You're, some of us, we were so quiet today, and I know when that happens, Lord, you are actually, Holy Spirit, you're doing what you do. And this morning, Holy Spirit, I ask, Lord, that you continue to press upon us until we comply to whatever you want us to do, Lord, that we could get out of ourselves and allow you to work in us and through us so that we can actually do what you call us through this earth realm in the short time that you have us here, Lord. We're not going to always be here. And Lord, when we stand before you, Lord, I desire to hear job well done, good and faithful servant as opposed to, Lord, I wish I'd have done more. I wish I could have, would have, should have, could have. Father, help us to be delivered from that mindset. Lord, there are those of you, there are this morning who are here who are hurting, who are literally going through painful situations right now. Father, I pray that they embrace it and say, Lord, your grace is sufficient today and forevermore. Lord, do whatever it takes to, 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 to mold me that I may yield to the thing you would have me to be. Father, there are those who come through some hurt and some pain, and, and Lord, they're sitting by pat, not doing anything. Father, I pray that you move their hearts and you stir them up to do, Lord, what only they can do. Only they can minister to the couple who's been on drugs because they've been set free from drugs. They can minister to the couple who's been on uh, been alcoholics and they've been set free from it. So, Father, I pray that you move people off of their, their, their laurels and they, they begin to utilize, Lord, what you use in their lives to free them to help others. Father, we thank you this morning because you love us so much, Lord. You're willing to, Lord, to allow us to experience the pain. But Lord, there's a purpose for the pain you cause us. And it's not because you don't love us, it's because you do love us and you want what's best for us. So Father, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning for every pain point we have. Because we understand, Lord, it is to be used for your glory that somebody might come to know you, which is the end game. So forgive us, Father, for sitting pat, not utilizing what you've given us. Forgive us, Lord, for not being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, but thinking it's always someone coming against us when it's your very hand many times, Lord, trying to mold us into who you would have us to be. Lord, I thank you for this hour we've had, and I ask, Father, as we leave today, again, we'll be transformed in your likeness, even more so. In Jesus' name I pray. Church said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated.